Welcome back. My name is Josh Rogan. I'm a columnist at the Global Opinions section of the Washington Post, and it's my honor to bring to you today an interview with the head of Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Phil Davidson, making his return appearance at the Halifax International Security Forum. Admiral Davidson, thank you so much to, for taking the time to participate. Next year, we hope to see you again in Nova Scotia. Uh, thank you, Josh. A pleasure to be here. Aloha to everyone from Hawaii. Thank you, sir. In uh, conjunction with this year's forum, the Halifax International Security Forum has released a new report it calls, quote, China versus democracy, the greatest game. In the introduction, uh, Halifax President Peter Van Praag writes, quote, the challenge is no longer about trying to cooperate with a rising China governed by autocrats. The real challenge for the world's democracies is how to cooperate effectively with each other. Do you agree with that? And if so, how do you think that's going? Well, um, I, I've, I've made no secret of the fact, Josh, that uh, the rules-based international order uh, here since the end of World War II and the convergence around the idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific is what's bringing free nations in the Indo-Pacific uh, together um, I've been quite encouraged by that convergence. Uh, the visions put forth not only by the United States, but by Japan, reinforced by the new prime minister, uh, Prime Minister Suga, uh, India, Australia, New Zealand, ASEAN under Indonesia's leadership. These have all been uh, uh, you know, important state statements of what the region values out here. And I view it as our uh, job to help knit together those allies and partners, you know, preserve the freedoms uh, that come with that network, and certainly ensure the access uh, to the seas, to the skyways, to cyberspace, to space, uh, for those nations interested in cooperating with each other, uh, pursuing their mutual prosperity and security concerns, and uh, working together under the idea that the rules-based international order does uh, the very best for all the nations in the region. Thank you very much. Uh, as a quick follow-up, I would note here that last weekend, regional leaders convened virtually for the ASEAN summit and the East Asia summit, but no U.S. cabinet-level official participated in either event. Beijing happily filled the vacuum and signed a 15-nation trade deal called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Was this a missed opportunity to rally like-minded countries to confront the China challenge? Well, I, I, my experience working with our allies and partners out here is, uh, you know, they are quite close to the United States and what the United States believes out here and the principles of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, the trade discussion in the United States has been a quite difficult discussion uh, through two different administrations. Uh, I don't know what the opportunity uh, presents itself when it comes to the future of that. Uh, but I was quite encouraged that National Security uh, Advisor O'Brien participated uh, in that summit and put forth the U.S. policy positions uh, that were um, addressed there. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, turning back to your own uh, area of focus, uh, the Halifax Handbook also states, quote, the PRC has committed to modernizing its military while growing bolder and more assertive geostrategically and not just in Asia. What may sometimes look like innocent and incremental steps risk developing into a pattern that, in a decade or two, could transform the balance of military power as well as the relevance of alliances and partnerships amongst democracies. Do you agree with that? And what is your assessment of the balance of military power in the region and the trend that it's following? Uh, certainly, uh, China has been modernizing their capability throughout the course of the 21st century, and it has absolutely accelerated. Uh, since 2012, when Chairman Xi came into power. Um, and you're seeing it in four crucial areas. So first, it comes with capability, stuff, right? Um, they're creating very advanced uh, platforms and weapon systems to go with those platforms in, in the naval or maritime sphere, uh, it, with their air forces, with their rocket forces, certainly. Um, a key uh, asymmetry in the region uh, as well as cyber and space forces as well. Um, the China will test more uh, missiles, uh, conventional and um, nuclear-associated missiles, uh, this year 
than every other nation added together on the planet. Uh, so it gives you an idea of the scale of how these things are changing. And, and the changes are almost as profound in the maritime, uh, w w with their naval and coast guard forces and maritime militia forces, as well as their air forces as well. But they're also advancing their training. So I think you know all too well that they've been deeply involved through the course of the summer uh, with a, a deep multi-theater exercise. Uh, it has persisted through the fall here. I expect it to continue actually for several more weeks. Uh, and in that exercises, they're getting after the third thing that they're advancing, which is the joint structure. And we're seeing a much deeper joint integration across all those domain forces, cyberspace and the terrestrial ones, air, maritime, uh, and land forces and rocket forces as well. And then lastly, they're getting after the modernization of what we call combat support. That is logistics, munitions, sustainment, how to do command and control, all those things. We're seeing great advances in their modernization there. It is a severe challenge, uh, not only in one of those areas, but absolutely in all four of those areas for our allies and partners in the region, as well as the United States, uh, because our force structure is not expanding uh, in the way that that uh, force structure, particularly in the, in the first category I gave you there, um, additionally, there is a, a, an incredible asymmetry in the region, and that is the Chinese rocket forces and what it's capable of doing in both uh, terms of its capability, but its numbers as well, and, and how that presents a threat, uh, not only to its key security uh, concerns along the, the border, but certainly along the whole First Island chain, um, another uh, key security concern. It's one of the reasons that I've been a key advocate for integrated air and missile defense. Um, certainly partnered with Japan uh, to talk about their needs, uh, the needs that the United States actually has in that uh, area as well, uh, as well as my advocacy for integrated air and missile defense in Guam in order to protect the U.S. territory of Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas. We have billions of dollars in military capability, command and control, um, U.S. citizens, hundreds of uh, 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 thousand uh, citizens of Guam alone, uh, that we need to protect. Uh, and it's an important statement for the United States, uh, important uh, uh, deterrent of important deterrent value uh, to have an integrated air missile defense capability station right there in Guam. You've told us a lot now about capabilities. Uh, what do you assess as the intent of CCP leaders as they focus on this expansive and ambitious strategy? Well, they, they have not been discreet about it at all. Um, they've said both publicly and privately uh, that they are on a 100-year plan uh, to, pursue, to um, uh, uh, produce an outcome in which uh, China returns to great power status uh, by the year 2049. And they've had an incremental set of five-year plans uh, to get after certain objectives uh, along that timeline. Uh, in the most uh, recent uh, plenum, you know, putting forth a vision uh, for goals in 2035. And I should note that they're advancing a lot of those goals. And they view that great power uh, status as you know, world-class military that can compete or supplant the United States and the United States role as the leader of the international order and to deliver an international order that is, uh, that is, it, it is beholden to Chinese characteristics, which I think has sent a chill uh, throughout the region. Um, and I think it's why you've also seen so many come forward with the idea that a free and open Indo-Pacific is uh, an important value set to have. Who wants to align with a country that has a closed and authoritarian internal order? Um, certainly not the United States and certainly not the allies and partners that I meet with in the region. I understand, thank you so much. Uh, in a, an interview that you did with me in Singapore at another conference last year, uh, you talked about this plan uh, for the C Chinese uh, to supplant the US-led international order and replace it one with, with one that has Chinese characteristics. And you said a competitive strategy is defined as a deterrence strategy, deterrence to prevent conflict going forward and to dissuade China from pursuing these ambitions. 
Uh, looking around, it seems to many of us that China it has not changed its behavior and therefore is not yet deterred. Would you agree with that assessment? Why or why not? Well, uh, I, I think certainly uh, uh, China has continued its pernicious whole party approach to the region in the diplomatic realm, in the information realm, economically, and uh, with using uh, military and, uh, and militia-associated uh, coercive tactics in the region. Um, uh, and you've seen uh, the, the, the expansion of its use of what we call out here in the headquarters uh, lawfare. Um, it's the kind of thing that they've done to Hong Kong where they've um, you know, imposed the national security law on Hong Kong, uh, limiting freedoms there. You've seen the tensions along the line of actual control with India. You've certainly seen what's going on in Xinjiang. Uh, with the imprisonment, frankly, the establishment of concentration camps uh, that are <laughs> enslaving the Uyghurs. And then, of course, we've seen a number of activities out here in and around Taiwan, uh, violations of their air defense um, identification zone, um, somewhat uh, 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 transits of uh, Chinese vessels across uh, what has been uh, a status quo, but unofficial establishment of a midline uh, between Taiwan and uh, the PRC as well. Um, uh, so you're seeing continued encroachment. I think that encroachment is matched with the rhetoric that you see come out of the policy level, the plans uh, and other things. Uh, but certainly the posture and the response by our allies and partners of the region, our own military posture is there to help prevent more coercive actions uh, in the future. So just to put a finer point on it, you're saying they're not yet deterred, is that correct? No, they are deterred from taking uh, military action at this time, uh, but uh, we as a nation with our allies and partners have to be competing in the, the kind of all uh, domain, excuse me, domain's not the right word, uh, you know, in the other spheres, uh, diplomatic, information, economic as well, uh, out there to prevent further encroachment by the Chinese and to preserve the sovereignties of all the other nations. Understood. It seems that competing will cost money. Uh, in the fiscal 2020 National Defense Authorization Act, Congress inserted language called Section 1253, requiring you as the head of Indopaycom to deliver a report detailing the combatant, what the combatant command needs to fulfill the national defense strategy and maintain an edge over China. In your report, you called for almost $20 billion over the next few years in new uh, funding to, quote, regain the advantage and compare that to a Pacific version of the European Defense Initiative. Now, seven months after you filed that report, have you seen any movement in that direction? Is Congress responding to your calls? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I was quite encouraged by the markup that was uh, released just last week, uh, getting after a, a number of our, our very first uh, priorities that we established in that 1253 report. Um, I'm also very encouraged by the dialogue and uh, uh, the authorizer's view of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative and how important it will be to help preserve our deterrent posture out here and actually regain the advantage. Um, so I was quite pleased with the tasking. It, it's been a consistent theme out of this headquarters, certainly for the whole of my uh, tenure out here, uh, that we need to improve uh, the capabilities that we have. We've got to be able to uh, assure and defend our first island chain allies, uh, meet our obligations by the Taiwan Relations Act, uh, defend uh, U.S. homeland, in the second island chain and beyond, frankly, um, uh, by maintaining a deterrent posture forward that can both deter uh, military action, you know, uh, let the Chinese know that any military action uh, that they might try to pursue uh, that would endure heavy costs uh, brought by ourselves and potentially the allies and partners out there in the region, uh, as well as assure um, our allies and partners that we are remaining uh, and that we continue to be uh, have deep Indo-Pacific interests and continue to be a Pacific power. Uh, we want to strengthen our allies and partners in the region. I've been quite encouraged by the pursuit 
uh, of um, multilateral exercises, um, Malabar, which is ongoing right now uh, with the United States, India, Australia, and Japan uh, in its second phase. Uh, I'm very encouraged to see uh, that exercise return to its, its quad-like structure uh, for the first time in more than a dozen years. Um, I'm also encouraged by uh, the, the integration of U.S. arms uh, and capabilities in other uh, militaries across the region, Australia, Japan, Korea, leading the way there, uh, especially in integrated air and missile defense, for example. Uh, and then lastly, uh, one of the things that I think has got traction in the department and I'm seeing, seeing the services move out on is the idea that we need to improve our, um, our test and training ranges out here to really be able to adapt to live virtual and constructive uh, capabilities, bring in the all domain capabilities that the military is bringing in and space, cyber, fifth gen aircraft, integrated air and missile defense, the, the forcible entry concepts, the Marine Corps and the Army are bringing to bear. These are all really, really important. And we have to advance the training range structure out here in order to experiment, to innovate, and to train that joint force in much higher level multi-domain or distributed uh, operations going forward. And uh, we'll continue to hit on those themes uh, through the 1253 uh, report, but most importantly, through the regain the advantage vision that we've established there um, with the idea that uh, more needs to come later. Uh, these things are are never ending. They're, you know, you engage on these Understood. things and, and you have to continue to engage on these things in order to get the resources you need, get people to understand uh, uh, the investments that are required, particularly as the threat environment evolves out here. Very important. Understood. Thank you, sir. Uh, we've seen a lot of discussion about the PLA's increased efforts to exert influence and power in what it sees as the first island chain. You mentioned that already briefly. But more and more, we are seeing discussion of China's efforts to influence and even control both governments and maritime spaces along what it regards as the second island chain, which includes U.S. partners. What do you see China doing in, the, in those areas and what needs to be done to push back on that initiative specifically? Well, certainly in the military sphere, they have begun uh, wider deployments uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, indeed across the globe. Um, we, we are certainly cer seeing... Uh, 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 maritime forces both under the sea and on the sea venture farther afield outside the first island chain. We're seeing uh, PA, uh, PLA bombers uh, uh, conduct operations uh, as far out as in the Philippine Sea. Um, I, I think you've read in the press yourself that you've seen them make uh, uh, targeting runs on places like Guam, uh, for example. So, you know, all that's going on in the military sphere. They also have uh, a lot of work going on in the information sphere where they are they are using propaganda tools uh, across the region to call into question uh, the staying power and the veracity of the United States and to advertise um, you know their own uh, agenda there in the region. Wider diplomatic footing, um, deeper engagements with not only uh, individual nations as far out as the Second Island chain. Uh, but engagements with like the Pacific Island forums, you know, a key multilateral um, forum out here uh, as well. And then you are seeing a devastating amount of corruption um, under the table payments with business and government elites um, all across the globe uh, and certainly uh, with the Indo-Pacific. Some of it tied to the um, one belt, one road uh, posture they have, but others uh, tied to other state uh, enterprise activity that they, they have out here in the region. Um, and then lastly, we're seeing an expansion of uh, PLA uh, attaches, for example, uniformed attaches in their embassies abroad. Um, this, this is all part of this very pernicious um, all-party approach to the region to get to their 2049 vision. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Uh, you talked about the ongoing exercises, PLA exercises. Uh, according to China's own state media, uh, they report that the PLA has successfully tested two new ballistic missiles, DF-26 and DF-21D, uh, the world's first ballistic missiles capable of targeting large and medium-sized vessels. Some call them aircraft carrier killers. Uh, one report in the Chinese media actually said that they had tested it successfully against a moving ship. Is that true? Is, do you, can you confirm that 
uh, report that they've successfully tested aircraft carrier missiles against moving ships? And if so, what does that mean for our uh, uh, response and our deterrence posture? It's uh, an indication that they continue to advance their capability. Um, we've known for years that they were in pursuit of a capability that could attack moving targets. Um, I don't use the term carrier killer, and I don't think others should, um, because uh, it, 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 it indicates that the Chinese are targeting a specific asset. Trust me, they're targeting everything. Uh, they use the term carrier killer. So you're confirming that 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 uh, that they're they did successfully test this move against a moving ship. They they did test an anti-ship uh, ballistic missile against a moving target. I'll leave it at that. Um, as I said, they've been in pursuit of that capability for a long time. Um, I'm quite confident that the tactics, techniques, procedures, and the counters that our forces out here, not just the maritime forces, but all of our forces, including Siren Space Forces, are pursuing, um, will help counter um, such threats um, and be able to deliver the offensive fires that we need to be able to deliver uh, to prevent uh, and impose to prevent Chinese objectives and impose costs where necessary. Understood. Thank you. There are also reports uh, this week that Chinese troops used quote unquote microwave weapons against Indian soldiers in the Himalayan standoff. Uh, can you confirm is that true? Have you have you noticed the use of microwave weapons in your theater by Chinese troops? And what is that? What should we think about that? I don't have anything for you on that, Josh. Understood. Thank you. Uh, you know, we you mentioned that uh, the Chinese PLA is increasing its intimidation of Taiwan and its buildup on its side of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, what do you intend assess as the intention of CCP leaders in taking those steps vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? In other words, do you think they're preparing to invade Taiwan? Um, in, in the very near term, I don't believe that they're preparing to invade Taiwan. But Taiwan uh, remains uh, an objective of the PRC, and President Xi himself has said that they are not ruling out uh, military action to do so. Thank you. Uh, turning to North Korea, uh, is it your assessment that North Korea's missile and nuclear capabilities are lesser or greater than they were when this administration came into office? If greater, what happened and why, what needs to be done about that? Yeah, as long as uh, North Korea retains its nuclear capability, it will remain the most immediate threat uh, to, 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 I think, U.S. interests out here in the region, as well as our allies and partners uh, in the first, um, uh, th throughout the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, that said, there were a number of new missiles uh, paraded at that October 10th parade. Uh, by our count, some eight new missiles that have been developed during the course of the last five years or so. Um, it, the, the rocket forces within North Korea have been a long-term uh, objective that they would continue, that, that I, we expected them, frankly, to continue to pursue during this time frame. Um, but I think it should uh, remain the United States' objective to pursue a nuclear-free, verifiable, fully free, uh, North Korea, and um, uh, and I think it's in the interest of all our allies and partners in the region as well. Thank you. Uh, do you assess that North Korea has the capability now to hit the continental United States with one of these new uh, ballistic missiles? We have not seen uh, the kind of test profile that would make me think that they could do that consistently. Um, but uh, given what they have paraded, they are certainly pursuing a class of missiles uh, that would enable them to reach out to the United States, yes. So just to be clear, you don't assess, you, you're not sure that they have that capability right now, but they might? Is that what you're saying? No, I haven't seen them test that capability, no. Understood. Uh, Admiral, turning to South Korea. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion recently about significantly drawing down the presence of, uh, and level of U.S. troops there. Uh, President Trump himself has suggested this. Um, do you support such a drawdown? What do you think are the risks and, and or the benefits? 
Uh, I'm not going to contrast this with uh, the president's. The president has issued no guidance uh, to me to draw down troops here in, in the Republic of Korea. Understood. Thank you, sir. Emerald, I realize that you're not serving in a political role, so I won't ask you about politics. But it seems clear a new administration is about to receive the handoff from the Trump administration. And assuming that that's the case, as is likely, actually definite, uh, what do you think it's important for the next team to understand about what Indo-Pacific Command has been doing over these last four years? And what message would you send to the incoming administration about the activities that you're engaged in and the challenges that they face? Well, certainly we've been in pursuit of what we've been in pursuit of out here for the last 70 years since uh, the Indo-Pacific, then the Pacific Command uh, was formed during the course of World War II. And that's to help to deliver on peace and prosperity out here in the region. And that means defending the United States, defending our allies uh, uh, throughout the region, and defending our U.S. interests abroad. Uh, we will remain in pursuit of the kind of posture that helps provide for that defense uh, and pursue those uh, interests and uh, going forward. Uh, the, the, that mission um, remains unchanged, and um, we'll continue to pursue it out here. Thank you, sir. Last question. Um, the entire world is dealing with the coronavirus pandemic and its associated effects. How has that affected Indo-Pacific Command operations? Uh, what have you been forced to do to adjust to this new reality? And how is your command uh, responding uh, to the pandemic both in theater and also in your headquarters in Hawaii? Well, for many of our forces, it's required us to uh, create bubbles uh, to ensure that we have uh, COVID-free environments, uh, not only in uh, confined platforms like ships or aircraft, uh, but um, for the troops uh, and exercises that we might send abroad uh, to engage with our partners. Um, it's also required us to pursue um, the testing, absolutely, uh, but then on return, of our forces, the kind of uh, restriction of movement requirements um, that are required to ensure that we're not bringing the disease uh, back to home stations, so to speak. Um, it's been a great sacrifice for our families uh, and our servicemen and women across the theater because it's limited their ability uh, to see family, go on leave, travel across the United States, do those kind of things uh, as well. Uh, but it's been a great assurance to our allies and partners that what we pursued, both for our troops that are stationed abroad um, and all of our forces that uh, rotate abroad, that they've um, uh, uh, been able to maintain uh, the, 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 the posture necessary uh, to deliver uh, troops that remain ready, um, can provide those deterrent forces. Uh, that are capable of support and continue the assurance and engagement uh, so necessary with our allies and partners in the region. Um, very grateful for the inventive uh, and innovative things that uh, our troops and our commanders have come to to create these environments. But without a doubt, it has been a strain on the force that has required uh, them to be more, more uh, vigilant, more diligent about uh, staying COVID-free, Certainly, and it's taken away from uh, their time with family. And I, I'm grateful that they would do that kind of thing to maintain the readiness of the force. Uh, Admiral, we are also grateful uh, to them for their service. And we're grateful to you for your service and sacrifice. And thank you so much for spending this time with us today. Thank you, Josh. Appreciate it. Aloha, everyone. Hope to see you in Halifax next year.